Leisure. So, with Acts chapter 9 now um, in our front mirror, let's jump in. We're going to learn a lot more about Saul, who I mentioned in my prayer is going to um, become a person named Paul. But Saul was born in Tarsus of Cilicia, a community of Jews most closely following the Greek culture rather than the Hebrew culture. This Greek culture is called Hellenism. Uh, Tarsus was on the northeast coast of the Mediterranean, and I've got a big red arrow right here uh, pointing to Tarsus. So down here is uh, Damascus, and then further down, about down in here, actually I'm going to mention a little bit later, about 135 miles south of Damascus is where Jerusalem is at. Um, but Saul was born up here in Tarsus of Cilicia. Uh, so there you can see all of Asia Minor and other areas that you read about in the book of Acts, Galatia, Cappadocia, and so on, a lot of different names. So you can go to any website on the, the internet and uh, kind of Google um, Saul or Google whatever you want. You can get maps like this. There's just thousands of maps available. So I'd encourage you to do that because it's just really helpful to, in my mind's eye to get a picture of where these places are at. But what Tarsus was famous for was a black wool a wool that was used to make blankets and tents. And from later in scripture, we read that Paul, after he um, gets renamed from Saul to Paul, he actually becomes a tent maker. And that's kind of how he earns his living, uh, traveling around from place to place. Whenever he stopped in one place long enough, he made tents, actually. And he became very familiar with how to do this growing up in Tarsus, where they had this famous black wool that was used for making bl uh, blankets and tents. Tarsus was the location of basically, or one of the three main theological centers of the area at the time. The first one being Athens in Greece, the second one of Alexandria out of Egypt, and then the third one, Tarsus. So it was um, kind of the third in ranking of the most prominent uh, scholarly areas that you could go to uh, for an education. And, and so Saul was brought up there uh, briefly, um, probably until he was 13, because when he was about 13, uh, history says that he, his parents decided to send him away to Jerusalem to go to a more private school there, um, to, to more follow the Hebrew culture, uh, since he was a Jew. Um, Saul could speak Hebrew and Greek, so that's one of the um, things that we're going to read about later on how God prepared a certain man, we're calling Saul, to do miraculous things. Um, we're just starting to get to know Paul here in the book of Acts, um, and there's just the rest of the book of Acts is just going to be an incredible, eye-opening experience on who this Saul and then Paul becomes and what he's done for us. And we just owe him such a... I've heard Pastor Kevin and Pastor David talk about Saul and Paul, uh, and how, you know, two-thirds of the New Testament is what he wrote. He just provided so much of our literature in our Bible that it's amazing. And we'll talk about how he was able to do that in, in just a few minutes here. So Saul was also a Roman citizen. Let's see if things are going to slide here. Saul, by birth um, or blood, is a Jew. Saul, by culture or his upbringing, was more of a Greek or a Hellenist. And then his citizenship, was also, which is, was also by birth, he is Roman. So he's got a lot of different things going on in his life, um, and that's what we're going to get into here now in chapter 9. We will see kind of what we call a radical conversion of a radical person called Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul the Apostle, and he writes much of the New Testament, as I alluded to a minute ago. Uh, he's a, a rabbi radical, we're going to learn also, who turned into a ra radical Christian. Uh, Saul did everything with passion. When he was a non-Christian, he severely persecuted, persecuted the Jews. And when he became a Christian, he was then also radically for Jesus Christ. He just didn't do anything half-heartedly. Um, in the book of Revelation, there's a, a passage there that I want to read um, where Jesus is speaking to the, the lukewarm church or the Laodosians. In Revolution, Revelation uh, 3, chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, it reads, except my screen isn't advancing. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, wait, this is not the right verse. <laughs> 
it's hard to tell with uh, not showing you. Sorry. Let's start over. Revelation 3.15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Uh, Jesus was really saying, you know, you've you got to be preferably hot. But if you're going to be cold or hot, I, I can deal with that. But if you're going to be lukewarm, kind of somewhere in the middle, sitting on the fence, that, that's, that's not good for me. I'm just going to spew you out of my mouth. He says, vomit you out of my mouth. That is not a good uh, position or a place to be. And I found this quote about John Wesley said, I want my religion like I want my tea. I want it hot. Uh, and that's the way Jesus wants us. He wants us to be hot, uh, full bore for our faith. And that's what Saul was. So now we're going to read a couple sections of scripture. And then we're going to come back and um, expound on those passages of the scripture. So let's start off with uh, chapter 9, Acts 9, verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 9. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of De Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, having a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. <clears throat> so back in verse 1 we see that Luke, the author of Acts, remember uh, way back when I was um, speaking on uh, Acts chapter 1, I gave a long history or an introduction, I guess, to the whole book of Acts, and we know Luke to be the author of the book of Acts. He continues his story and tells, and Luke tells us that Saul is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Um, his whole life breath was to get rid of those um, people threatening Judaism. Um, so evidently, because it says still, uh, if you look at every word, you've got to look at carefully in the Bible. Uh, as I just read through verses 1 through 9, there was a lot of stuff there. But you really have to pay particular attention, even in the English, to, to not miss anything. Because every word is, like Pastor David said, is not fluff. There's something there for a specific reason. So when it says still breathing, it just implies you know, that Saul has been in Jerusalem for a while, and he's been causing havoc for a while. And at this point, now when Luke starts to record this, he's been evidently breathing threats and murderous ideas to the Jews in Jerusalem for a long time. So that's why Luke says he's still breathing these threats. And then also it mentions the high priest. This high priest, um, if you happen to be taking notes and want to know, well, who is the high priest? At this given time, the high priest is Caiaphas. And Caiaphas is going to be the high priest for about another seven years uh, going forward in time here. Verse 2, it says, And asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The way was a title uh, for those that were calling themselves followers of Jesus. They weren't really being called Christians yet. Uh, but the Christians, for lack of a better term, are the followers of Jesus. They were calling that sect, really, is what they kind of outlined it here in Scripture. They called them following the way. Um, it was a title for the followers of Jesus. They weren't called Christians. I believe it was not until Acts chapter 11 where it mention, mentions uh, Christians, and they were first called um, Christians in uh, 11.26, I think it was, in... Antioch. Christians in Antioch is where that first came about. And notice also that it says here that he wanted to go to Damascus and bring back men and women and possibly children, anyone professing the way 
and bring them back bound. Not just bring them back, but bring them back bound in fetters and in chains, however he could get them, probably in a, 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 a single file line, just kind of bound together. Like It reminds me of watching that movie um, uh, of her, uh, I can't even think of the, the Charlton Heston movie where Ben-Hur, and they were leading uh, people uh, from one place to another and they just had the chains or ropes around their wrists and around their waists and around their ankles and just following them. Uh, who knows, maybe Saul was doing that type of leading of the people. That was his intent anyway. He never got to do it. Uh, on his way to Damascus, something else miraculous happened. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute as well. But before we get any further, there are some passages of Scripture that we want to read that are parallel to this Acts chapter 9 experience. So in Acts 22, we get a um, revisiting of his conversion experience of here in Acts 22 and 26, it is now Paul by name, not Saul. So he's calling himself Paul now, and he's talking to other people. Luke is recording this, and he's kind of giving another account of his conversion that happened here in Acts 9. So Acts 9 didn't record everything that happened to Paul during that experience between Saul and Jesus. So that's why we're going to read Acts 22 and then some passages from Acts 26 as well to get the full picture of everything that happened between Saul and Jesus. So starting in verse 6, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. So that sounds familiar so far. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. So a little bit more detail, a few little things that Paul shares with us here in Acts 22. Now in 26, while thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, here he's talking to King Agrippa now. So Luke is recording this. At midday, O king, along the road I saw light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as, as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by me in faith. So quite a few more details there in Acts uh, 26. Uh, we're very appreciative of Luke recording those and letting us know what was actually said in its entirety that Paul let him know about. So go back to these words in verse 4 where Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What kind of amplification or what was his tone of voice when Jesus said this to Saul? I, I kind of have to imagine that it was not a, a, a really rough, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It could have been, but I doubt it. Um, I'm thinking it's more of a soft, passionate, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Maybe that tone of voice is what I'm imagining. Just like we hear Jesus speaking to Simon in, in other chapters of the Bible. He said, Simon, Simon. Or later when he spoke to Martha and he says, Martha, Martha. So he's being really compassionate. We see there's several passages in scripture where um, Jesus does have compassion on people. So I imagine he's at this point now where he's, he's been looking down on Paul and Paul has been doing terrible, horrendous things, uh, consenting to the death of many people, most recently Stephen that we read about in Acts chapter 7. 
So I'm, I'm certain here that um, Jesus was um, asking Saul in this tone of voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then also here in verse 4, we see Saul fell to the ground, as did the other men that were around him. And God sometimes has to get really stubborn people in a position where they will listen. And Saul, you can imagine, was a very stubborn person. Again, I mentioned a few minutes ago that whatever he did, he did it wholeheartedly. He was wholeheartedly persecuting Christians, and he's going to pretty soon become a wholeheartedly for Jesus a follower of Jesus, a kingdom builder. So a life lesson here is what we do to one another, we do to Jesus. What we do to one another, we do to Jesus. Jesus completely identifies himself with the church. Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my church? He says, why are you persecuting me? Not my church, but me. So Jesus really identifies with us and the church. Every person that Saul tried to kill or hurt, he was doing that to Jesus, essentially. So we are his body, and so whatever we do, we're doing it to Jesus' body, essentially. So think of this verse, maybe the next time you say something mean or type something in an email mean, uh, and, and you know it's going to another brother or sister in Christ, that's a that's a body, that's a part, that's affecting Jesus. And he says, why are you persecuting me? He doesn't say my church, but me. Uh, to me, that's, um, that's, that's pretty important. And here in verse 5, and he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. He says, who are you, Lord? Very good question. Very good questions. How often do we ask that question? Who are you, Lord? Lord, what would you have me to do? He's going to ask that question next. And that's another very good question. Many Christ Christians don't ask that question enough. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Um, we, we kind of maybe say that in our prayers in passing. Um, but remember, as Pastor David has said, it needs to be a dialogue when we're praying. We can't just go into a monologue discussion of praying one thing after another, after another, after another. It's like that person calling you on the phone and you just jibber, jabber, jibber, jabber, and talk and talk and talk, and then you hang up and that person that called you doesn't ever give you a chance to talk. It, it, it doesn't need to be that way. It, it shouldn't be that way. You need to be able to allow, to um, thank the Lord for whatever you're praying for and then have an opportunity to just sit quietly. I know that's really hard just to sit quietly. Maybe just try it for 30 seconds. 30 seconds of quietness at your table or at your chair, wherever you are, is a long time. So sit quietly for 30 seconds and then a minute or two minutes. And during that time, maybe with your eyes closed, just not doing anything, you may hear something. And so often that's when it is when I finally force myself to be quiet is when I finally hear something from the Lord. But back here in verse um, 4 also, it talks about kicking against the goads. I, again, Google, you find a, uh, a picture. Uh, this is a goad. This is probably in the neighborhood of anywhere from four to eight feet. I saw different descriptions of a goad. And this is something that a farmer or someone following his um, oxen, he would use it to goad them, to get them to turn left, turn right, if they didn't have the reins, but they're just to keep them going, basically. Um, they would poke them with this. And as that just kind of sticking out there, if the oxen didn't like that, they would kick you know, with their hind leg behind them, and that right there is where that goad would be if the farmer was holding it right there. Um, so they would kick against the goad, and they would hopefully feel the, the pain of that sharp point, and that would encourage them to keep going but not kick anymore. Um, but it, again, just a good visual to know what a goad is. Um, I think in some passages, or not some, pa some versions, they may mention, you know, kicking a prick or the goad. Um, so that's kind of what it's referring to there. So... Do we ever find ourselves being stubborn like an oxen? Do we ever find ourselves not listening to the conviction maybe that we're hearing from the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, if you're a believer, tries to convince and to convict us sometimes of something that we're maybe not doing. Maybe that's a sin of omission. Or most likely it could be something that we did that we shouldn't have been doing. Now we're feeling guilty and the remorse and that's the sin of or, of um, the sin of commission, the something that we actually did do. 
but are we fighting that conviction maybe that the Holy Spirit is goading us with this goad? He's kind of trying to get us going along a little bit quicker or in the right direction because maybe we're not following the direction that he told us to go in the first place. Um, are you being the stubborn one and not listening to the Lord? Again, try to get yourself in that quiet place where you can listen more often to what the Lord may be saying. And then there in verse 6 it says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Again, I mentioned that's a very good question. Up until this point, I think Saul probably thought Jesus was actually dead, physically dead and not to be heard from again. Uh, he had such a different upbringing that he, I mean, I, I lost, listened to a couple different teachers and they were saying, you know, that you know, Saul was born in Tarsus, he came to Jerusalem, he was raised there for um, between 13 and 21 as he attended the Jewish uh, um, Hebrew teaching school under Gamaliel. And after 21, he may have hung around there for a little while, and then he went back to Tarsus and eventually comes back to Jerusalem. Um, so he most likely came back in Jerusalem. I, I, I couldn't find this for a fact. I didn't follow the chronology, but um, maybe someone else might know for sure that he, I don't think he was in Jerusalem at the time that Jesus was there and at the time that he was crucified and during the time that that 40 or 50 days 40 to 50 days where he was still present in town and ministering to the disciples and being seen by over 500 people. Uh, I don't think Saul was in town during that time. I think he must have came back into town just after that. Again, that's my conjecture but because I, I couldn't find it for sure anywhere in here through the rest of the book of Acts. Um, but Paul could have thought that Jesus was physically dead and that was his mindset until this Damascus Road experience. So there's a 180 degree turnaround for Saul here that we're seeing now where at the point of him falling to the ground and then at, at this point saying, Lord, what would you want me to do? That's essentially when his conversion is taking place. Pretty much in a matter of a couple minutes from him riding on the road, either on his donkey or his horse or in a chariot, whatever it was, he was on his way to uh, Damascus. He had that conversion uh, after falling to the ground and seeing this bright shining light that just was brighter than the noonday sun. Here, there in this area, the noonday sun is immensely bright and this overshadowed the noonday sun, it said there in Acts 26. So very amazing and it, it forced everybody to the ground, him and the people he was traveling with and it, therefore it then un, ended up blinding him as well. So verses 7 and then 8 into 9, I want to read 9, and he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Three days without sight and he fasted of all food and drink. By God's will, Saul was without sight. Saul was kind of like a photograph, um, a blast of light, and then he needed time in the dark to think. Saul, Saul was like a, a photograph, a blast of light, and then he needed some time in the dark to think. And that's exactly what the Lord gave him. He gave him three days of total blindness. Scales formed on his eyes that we'll read about later that eventually fall off when Ananias prays for him. So for three days he was at without sight, but then there was three days where it was by Saul's will that he neither ate nor drank. So that was his choice. Can you imagine what Saul must have been going through or thinking about during those times, maybe sitting in um, this house, we're going to read it's in the house of Judas, there on the street called Straight in Damascus for three days in a house that he was not familiar with probably just pondering and thinking, going back to all the teachings that he had received from Gamaliel, um, all the different prayers and stuff that he must have learned and all the different things that he did. Was he thinking about what he had just done or consented to with Stephen just not that long ago in his life? Um, just amazing to think about what he must have been praying about at this point in time. So let's go to verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus. Oh wait, we're going to read verses 10 through 19. So now we're jumping in another passage of my Bible called Ananias Baptizes Saul. So verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. 
And then he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming. That's you, by the way, Ananias. I'm talking to you. You're <laughs> coming in and in putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. So it says in verse 10 that immediately Ananias says, Here I am, Lord. So all the Lord had to say, in my Bible it's red text, so Jesus is saying, Ananias. One word, the guy's name, and it's like the Lord immediately springs out of bed and says, Here I am, Lord. I mean, that is a tune listening to the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't know if I, well, I can... There's, there was one time where I think I was spoken, well, I know I was spoken to the Lord that quickly, and I responded, and it actually saved a person's life, maybe. So that's, that's why I remember so quickly, and that's a different story I won't get into right now. But he told me to, all it was was move the bucket. And I moved the bucket, and it may have saved a guy's life who doesn't go to work here anymore. You can ask me about it after the teaching. But Ananias, he heard this, and he says, here I am, Lord, uh, what shall I do? Um, that, that to me is just amazing that he was so in tune and then he was able to listen to what the Lord said and then he did what the Lord says. It says he was a certain disciple at Damascus. So there was evidently many other disciples there and as I alluded to, Saul had already been in Jerusalem. He was traveling around, not traveling, he was going around Jerusalem finding people that were followers of the way, binding them, persecuting them, killing some of them and now he was going on his way to Damascus. Um, because the people were living in Jerusalem and they knew Saul was there, previously to Saul coming to Damascus, they had fled from Jerusalem going to Damascus because they knew that there was a Jewish um, group of believers there in Damascus. So they were going there for their kind of their protection and just to be among and around other people like themselves. So that's why they went to Damascus. So he was one of a disciple and he wasn't an apostle. He was just a disciple, but uh, and a disciple that was very mature and able to have such a relationship with the Lord that he immediately responded when the Lord asked him. So what an awesome disciple this Ananias was. There's going to be people in the Bible that you just want to meet someday. I don't know, maybe Ananias is, is one of them. But it just as you're reading through Scripture, just think about, put yourself in this perspective. I know Pastor David says this quite often. Uh, just read a passage of scripture and then close your eyes and think about what was that really like to be there, to be sitting wherever Ananias was, it doesn't say, and you hear one word, you hear your name, Tom. Oh, that's Lord. That's not my wife calling from the other room. That's the Lord. I mean, to, to know that and to recognize that and to respond to that is just amazing. And then in verse 11, it says this street called Straight. And I was just wondering, is, is God trying to maybe show a little bit of his humor here? Uh, is he trying to maybe uh, get to getting around to the point of straightening out Saul? And this house of Judas is on the house called Straight. I was just, again, just little humor. Is he trying to straighten out Saul? But this road called Straight in Damascus evidently is still there to this day. Damascus is one of the oldest cities still occupied in the world. Um, so it's a very old, and it goes, I believe, from east to west across the whole um, city-state of Damascus um, and it's still there today but that's where Ananias was sent to find this house and then to go in and and pray for this Saul so we also read here when the Lord is saying this is pretty cool and in a vision he sees a man 
Paul, or Saul at this point, sees a man named Ananias. And Jesus is talking to Ananias right now. So this is you, Ananias. He's seen you coming to him. And it says Saul is praying. So I bet his prayers are a little bit different now. Can you imagine what Saul's prayers must be like? I mean, again, as a, a Hebrew, as a Pharisee, he had a lot of different prayers that he had to memorize. He had probably prayers for weddings and prayers for funerals and prayers for deaths and prayers for births and prayers for birthdays and prayers for this, that, and the other. So many different prayers that the Pharisees had to rem remember and memorize. And now he is praying, is what Jesus says. Jesus tells Ananias he is praying. I bet it's not those memorized prayers. Again, I think it's a very heartfelt prayer, him doing an internal check on everything and him thinking about, oh my Lord, what did I do to Stephen? What did I do to all these precious people in Jerusalem? Why am I on my way to Damascus to find more of them? Remember, he's converted now and he's praying and he's got scales on his eyes and he's been fasting and he's, he's seeing this vision now of Ananias coming to him. So this is pretty amazing that uh, he's, his prayers have just got to be so different. Um, so I'm going to skip down, not skip, I've already read them, um, go down a little bit further in verse 15. It says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. He calls Saul a chosen vessel. So, uh, you know, a vessel is a container, a container that stuff is poured into and poured out of. So don't look at the, the, the vessel so much as what's in the vessel. We are vessels, essentially. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us if we're a believer. So don't look on the outward appearances as man does. Look more on the inside. You can, you ha the only way you can do that, though, is to get to know a person. So really you have to uh, join into a relationship with people before you can really get to understand who a certain person or what a certain person is all about. So this is just a reminder to me, you know, he's, Jesus is calling Saul a chosen vessel. Um, and it's not the vessel that's so important. You can probably Google and find a lot of different things. There's not a whole lot of personal descriptions of Saul or Paul in the Bible, but there's speculation of what Paul looks like. And he could have been, you know, a five foot seven something guy, kind of stocky and stout and a big nose and thick lips and something going on with his eyes. He may not have been all that something to look at, um, but his words were powerful. Uh, we just don't know what Saul looks like, but um, I think in other passages of scripture it does mention that he wasn't uh, all that um, great uh, in appearance. Um, uh, like Absalom, you know, we get quite a few different descriptions of, of Absalom in the Bible and how handsome he was and the great thick black head of hair that he had, for instance. But not, not a whole lot of uh, glamorous things being said about Saul or Paul. But it says also there in verse 15 that he's going to speak to uh, Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Um, uh, we already read in chapter 26 where it says that uh, Saul... Uh, at that time, Paul, he's got the opportunity now to speak to King Agrippa. And then also he's going to appeal to Caesar and then be sent to Rome. He's going to actually get to appeal and speak in front of Caesar Nero at one point in his life as well. So this is a very high commission that he has and that he's going to be sent on here going forward through the rest of the book of Acts that we're going to read about. So God needed a man with Saul's background a man that could address the Hebrews and a man that could address the Grecian, Grecian culture. Remember at the very beginning tonight, we talked about how Saul, Saul was brought up in Tarsus in a very uh, Greek culture, but then he also spent years and years uh, there in Jerusalem learning the Hebrew culture as well. He could speak Greek and he could speak Hebrew, um, probably not just those two languages, maybe others. Um, so he was a man with... Uh, a very well-rounded background and very knowledgeable. Again, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Um, and Saul now is starting to find out what his purpose is. God created us for a specific purpose. For those of you that have taken um, SOD recently, this verse it was one of the passages that you were asked to memorize. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are his workmanship. 
And we are finding out day by day by day what it is that God's purpose is for us. Some of us know exactly what that is. We're walking in it already. Others are still wondering, you know, what are we going to be when we grow up? Um, but that's kind of a, a work in progress for all of us, really. And Paul really right now is being spoken to by Jesus. Again, remember those little tidbits of information that we read about in Acts 22 and Acts 26. It says that um, there in verse chapter 9 here in verse uh, 6, Arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So he's getting his instructions right now from Jesus. And he will be for the next couple of years we're going to read here in just a second. Verse 17, it says, Ananias went his way and entered the house. What incredible um, obedience in the face of fear and uncertainty that Ananias exhibited here. Saul had tracked down and consented to many Christian deaths. And Ananias even tried to speak back, talk back to the Lord here, uh, back in his other passages and said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, Saul, that you want me to go to. Are you sure? He has done many harm to your saints. So I'm not sure if this is great, you know, the best idea type thing. It says there in verse 13. But again, verse 15, Jesus tells him to go. So he, what does he do? He up and goes. Immediately, uh, he up and goes. And then here in verse 17, how did Ananias address Saul? He says, brother, Saul. Again, imagine the compassion, I hope, that Ananias had there. I'm sure it was compassion, but again, think about the tone of his voice. Was his voice cracking a little bit because of nervousness or fear? Again, he knew who Saul was about. He wasn't fully convinced of his conversion yet, except for what Jesus told him to go and do. So was it brother Saul as he's laying his hand on him? I hope you're saved that as soon as we pray for you and the scales fall off that you're not going to turn around and look for a sword and stab me type thing. So, but it was most likely, hopefully, it was brother, Saul, welcome to the kingdom type thing. I hope that was the way that uh, Ananias spoke those words. I mean, I always wonder when I see Jesus' red letter text here or other people talking, what was the tone of their voice? Because, you know, we lose so much in the interpretation with our text messages and our emails. We just... There's, it's not a great way to carry on conversation. It's so much different than saying the same thing in a text message than saying the same thing face to face. You have the body language, you have the facial intonations, you have the tone of the voice. All that goes in there and we lose, unfortunately, so much of that in the translation or just reading text. So Brother Saul. So Saul's first words that he heard from the church is brother. Brother Saul. That, that's pretty cool, that Saul is a very brand new believer. After three days of being quiet in this room, wherever he was at, he's got a believer coming to him to pray for him now, and he says, Brother Saul. That's the first words from the church. The Holy Spirit, up until this point, had not been indwelling Saul. But now that he's a believer, he's had his conversion, and now Ananias prays for him and it says here he sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit there is, this receiving of the Holy Spirit is no doubt for the empowerment of service or what we're going to find out mainly to be a witness because Saul is going to be an incredible miraculous powerful witness to many many people again he wrote much of our New Testament um, and it's just amazing how powerfully strong the witness he ended up becoming. Verse 18, it says, He immediately um, arose and was baptized then after this prayer from Ananias. Many naysayers about things in the Bible, such as Saul's conversion, say that the Damascus Road experience was more of an experience by Saul of like sunstroke. It was just something weird that happened that, you know, it was a bad pizza night the night before. Uh, or maybe it was an even, I read, an epileptic seizure that Saul went through, and that's, that's how he experienced all this stuff. Just really weird type of things of naysayers of the Bible. Um, again, we don't find any of that in Scripture, of all that negativity. Uh, we read for it, and I, I like to keep it simple. I mean, I, whatever I read in the text, I, I don't try to read between the lines or anything like that. 
So, I mean, Paul is a believer now. And based on this um, naysayer saying, you know, that, that it was possibly an epileptic seizure, Charles Spurgeon, uh, back was in the 1600s, late 1600s, I think, of the time of uh, Spurgeon, or was it later than that? 1800s? Um, anyhow, quite a while ago, um, Spurgeon had this to say about the naysayers back then. Oh, blessed epilepsy, if it evokes a conversion such as this. <laughs> I mean, if it takes an epileptic seizure to cause this type of conversion, praise the Lord, let's, let's you know, type of thing. Uh, I just thought that was kind of funny as well. Uh, oh, blessed epilepsy, if it evokes a conversion such as this. Because many people probably thought that there was no possible way that someone like Saul could ever be converted to Christianity, right? That's what many people were thinking that, they know who Saul was from maybe historical or from reading the Bible. There's, there's no way that he could have been converted, but in fact, he was. So let's now go on and read the rest of what we're going to cover tonight, um, verses 20 through 25. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. All right, so there's the, the kind of the end of the passage that we're going to cover t for today. Going back to verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he, Jesus, is the Son of God. So the infilling that Saul received in uh, verse 17 must have been incredible to Saul since he immediately began preaching Jesus in the synagogues. Notice that he's in the synagogues in Damascus preaching Jesus right now. Where was he headed to back in verse 2? And what for what purpose? To the synagogues in Damascus to find Christians, bind them, and bring them back to Jerusalem. So that was his main intent, but now he's in Damascus in the synagogues preaching Jesus. Big turn of events, right? totally different than what his um, first impression was going to be, what he was going there for. And it says that he was able to do this and that the people there were amazed. But remember, Paul already had an amazing or incredible background uh, of understanding of the scriptures. All these scriptures now that he had learned going through the, the Hebrew school from age 13 roughly to 21 under the teaching of Gamaliel, for those years, all of that Hebrew scriptures started to come back to his mind, I'm sure. Everything that he read that he really didn't have a ingrained into his heart, it must have just really started to click in his mind. It all started to make sense. He was piecing everything together. Um, so, and that's why the people there were amazed, for one. So that was one reason they were amazed. Um, I'm sure the other part of the amazement was, can you imagine the people sitting around in the synagogues um, they're sitting in the red chairs like you are now, and in, in comes from wherever he came from, and he looks up, and the guys say, isn't that Saul? I think that's Saul. I mean, they must have been whispering and elbowing the person next to him, saying, that's Saul from Jerusalem. Oh my gosh, what's he doing here? And then he starts to expound on the, the scriptures and starts confirming what they already believe, that Jesus is, is the Lord. Amazing that he was able to do that in the synagogues where he wasn't intending to go there to, to do that. So pretty amazing. Here in verse 21, then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so they might bring them bound to the chief priests? As I was doing a little bit of research, um, I came across um, information about you know, how people sometimes find it really hard to believe that certain people can come to know the Lord. 
and I came across a passage about David Berkowitz. Anybody, that name sound familiar to anybody? Son of Sam, David Berkowitz, a mass murderer. He became a believer. He's still alive. He's in prison. He's 63. He's still alive and a believer. And he just got interviewed by somebody on, I think it was CSN or CNN, um, probably a year ago. And it's on YouTube. You can watch the 45-minute video. I didn't watch it all. But now he's just preaching now in prison how amazed he is and how God opened up his eyes and has revealed things to him. We don't hear about that in the news, do we? I mean, I was totally flabbergasted when I saw that on YouTube and actually started to watch the part of the video, but he's a believer now. Um, how about another person that we wouldn't have ever thought that Jesus would have compassion on and save them as well? Um, the, the mass murderer also who ate people, Jeffrey Dahmer. He became a believer. I didn't know that. That was news to me when I found it online. But a few years ago, he's dead now. But when they released him into population, they had kept, been keeping him by himself for a while, or whatever they call that, in seclusion. But at some point in time, for some reason, they released him into the general, pop, general population, and he was serving, I think, kitchen duty. And one of the inmates knew who he was, obviously, and killed him. Um, so that's, that's recorded. Uh, you can look at that on, not the, rec not the recording of the, the act, but the recording of his story is recorded online as well. So we can never think that anyone is beyond being accepted um, as a believer. And just those two examples there were just amazing to me that, I, again, I, the news hadn't shared the good stuff. Um, you know, that everything that we see on the news, it seems like if it doesn't, if it bleeds, it leads, I think is the tagline I've heard people say. It, it seems like all we ever hear about on the news and radio broadcasts, is, broadcasts are the bad things that are happening around us in the world, not some of the great things. Even though these men did terrible things, um, I mean, David Berkowitz is going to be uh, in prison for, I think, 365 years, I think is what his sentence was, if I remember reading that correctly. So, verse 22, But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Again, Saul had one of the finest teachers possible in Gamaliel, a Hebrew Pharisee, prior to the Damascus Road experience. And then he had Jesus' teaching in the desert for three years. We haven't touched on that yet, but I will in just a second. But the next life lesson I wanted to share, God uses instruments that he has prepared. I've talked about a little bit, you know, the preparation that God has already been doing in Saul and soon to become named Paul. But God uses instruments that he has prepared. All this time, everything bad that Saul did up until this point, God was still preparing him. He still had the, the, the knowledge to speak Greek. He still has the knowledge now to speak Hebrew. He's got all the, the pharisaical knowledge, the, the Hebrew scripture knowledge, so he knows the Bible, um, and, and soon he's going to be taught by Jesus. Preparation, though, is vitally important. New believers need time to build their foundation and to grow strong. Uh, all of us at one point was a very brand new believer. Um, hopefully some of you or all of you can remember back to that day where you accepted Jesus into your heart. For me, it was March 30th, 1996. I can still remember that night, uh, clear as day, because uh, Margaret and I just had a fight that night. And I was living down in Pinehurst, and I walked outside on the back steps of where we were living, and I, um, it, was, it was three years and one day after my mom had passed away. That's not what we were fighting about. But there was something else going on, and that's when I accepted Jesus. So I remember that, that, that night. I mean, it was late at night because I could see the stars, so it was probably 11 o'clock at night or so. But anyhow, I hope you guys can remember that type of experience as well on um, when you became a believer. But Saul had a lot of preparation going on in his life to get him to the point where he's at now. God is not in a hurry. We are the ones that often find ourselves in a hurry. Here at the bridge, we take our time, for instance, when we raise up um, deacons and elders and assisting pastors. Um, you, you could probably go here for one to two years, probably, and not hear about elders or deacons or pastors being raised up. Recently, we just raised up you know, two other assisting pastors and myself. But before that, it was, a, I think, a, a bunch of um, 
not a bunch, but a few elders that were raised up, and before that, it was a, a bunch of deacons that were raised up. So again, it, we go very slowly. Pastor David, uh, when he's wandering the hallways, he's got an eye out looking uh, around, but he also asks for input from all the deacons and elders and staff on you know, who do you see kind of already doing certain works, already work walking in certain um, talents or skills, giftings, and um, are they fulfilling the role of a deacon or an elder already? And then we come alongside what God has already done and then raise them up and give them that title uh, of a deacon or an elder or assisting pastor. So we take our time very slowly, and, and God does that as well. He wants to give us experience. Um, it takes time to become mature in our faith. We have to go through many different, um, sometimes good, sometimes bad experiences to, to mature us. So moving on to verse 22 and 23, in that area there that we already read, between verses 22 and 23, there's a gap of time not indicated in our texts. But if we were to go to Galatians chapter 1, there's a passage here that we want to read. Galatians 1, starting in verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus. So here in Galatians, this is Paul speaking. Okay, So this is Paul speaking um, a, a little bit time-wise after the, this occurrence in Acts. Verse 13, For you have heard of, many of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. So here's that gap of time that I'm referring to that allowed Saul to just increase in knowledge so much. He spent time in the desert, three years in Arabia. Not three days. Again, this is Saul and Jesus teaching. Can you imagine Jesus uh, being your teacher for not three days, not three weeks, not three months, Three months would have been a long time, right? Three months of nothing but one-on-one -on -one teaching, day in and day out, three months, three years. So Paul came, Saul, or Paul, I can't, I can't, Saul at this point, came back from that experience in the desert with his mind just has got to be blown with all of this knowledge that Jesus has laid out to him. And now he's back um, sharing some of this knowledge in the synagogues. Then he goes up in, to Jerusalem and speaks with Peter. Um, but he doesn't meet with all the different apostles. He meets with um, just Peter, it says here, and remained with him 15 days. But imagine what those conversations had to be like. Because um, Peter was immensely growing in his faith as well. Uh, and now we see Saul talking to him and sharing incredible knowledge. I mean, it's just got to be a knowledge bomb going on there between the two of those guys talking back and forth. Verse 25, it says here, uh, they let him down through a, a wall in a large basket. Uh, the walls around many towns in those days were actually filled, not filled, but had many openings in them. Not filled with glass like we would expect, but just kind of openings. And sometimes the walls were double walls. Um, kind of reminiscent of, um, man, drawing a blank here on uh, Jericho. Uh, Jericho, where the, the wall was kind of a double wall and people were living be between the, the two walls. Um, and then also uh, it should remind us maybe of uh, David's escape um, from King Saul once. Um, and then I think there was one other instance of an escape uh, such as this, but um, I can't remember it right now. 
But this was not the first attempt on Paul's life. We're going to read about many other experiences. Well, Pastor David just, mm, Pastor Kevin just talked about it just last, last Sunday, um, of the, the many different things that happened uh, to Saul in his life. Teachings are running together. I can't remember if it was Pastor Kevin or who was talking about all the different whippings and stuff. No, it was you. It was you. <laughs> That's why I was. the teachings are running together between Sunday and Thursday and Tuesday. Um, but the many different things was, that happened to, to Paul in his life of, of beatings and whippings and stonings and being uh, out on the, the ocean for day, a day and a night. Um, just amazing things that happened in his life, all in preparation to get him from where he was here on the Damascus Road experience during his conversion to, to where he uh, ended up being. So as we close for this section of chapter 9, uh, next week I'll finish uh, the rest of chapter 9. Uh, there's something I w wanted to share here. That God loves to use humans to reach others. Um, he could have easily just spoke down to each individual that he wants to and give them specific directions on what they should be doing in their life. Um, but we read just a few weeks ago when, I can't remember who was up here teaching Acts chapter 11, but if you go back and read chapter 7, you'll see that Saul was on the premises and he consented to Stephen being stoned to death. Not that Stephen and Saul conversed at that point in time that, that I know of, but and Saul looking back on that time and seeing what happened and uh, even hearing the words that Stephen spoke before he went to sleep, before he died, Saul thinking back on that, he is probably not directly but indirectly being spoken to by Stephen. Um, Saul probably was also um, looking for a chink in Stephen's words, but found none. You know, when the, that whole exposition that Stephen was doing in Acts chapter 7, um, Saul was listening and hearing all that and wondering, man, this guy is he's dead on. He's got everything right, and I can't find anything wrong with what he's saying. And he's probably remembering some of that. Then we see also Philip speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch. So again, God using people. Stephen speaking to Saul. Philip speaking to the eunuch in Acts 8, Ananias here speaking to Saul in Acts 9, and then in the next chapter, we're going to see Peter speaking to Cornelius in Acts 10. Again, all that just to mention that God wants to use us. He wants to use our mouth. He wants to use our hands and our feet. He will use you if you will let him. And just to elaborate or expound on this idea or concept of God being able to use people and what type of effect it could have on other people, think about a person named Edward Kimball. Back in 1856, this was a brand new Christian, and he was walking around, pacing outside of a shoe store, and he was wondering, he thought he was hearing from the Lord, that it was time to go in to the shoe store for whatever reason. He wasn't there to buy shoes. He, he was just told to go to the shoe store and go in and preach Christ to the shoe salesman. So when he did. He eventually went in. He talked to the shoe salesman, and the shoe salesman accepted Jesus Christ. This is Edward Christian in 1856. That shoe salesman was D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody eventually grew in, his, grew in his faith and led another person who I don't know much about F.B. Meyer to the Lord, who then F.B. Meyer leads another person, Wilbur Chapman, to the Lord. Wilbur Chapman obviously gets saved, and he works at a YMCA. Wilbur hires Billy Sunday to come in and preach at the YMCA. Billy Sunday then went to Charlotte to preach there, and he had done that for several times, and instead of him speaking one night, he brought in another person to speak there in Charlotte. Billy Sunday brings in Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham preaches in Charlotte one day, and one tall, lanky young man comes forward and gets saved. Who knows who that is? Billy Graham. Yep, so all because of, thank you, Edward Kimball, of his responding to that call in 1856, about going into a shoe store, not knowing who was in there, talking to this salesman, D.L. Moody, talks to F.B. Meyer, talks to Wilbur Chapman, talks to Billy Sunday, talks to Mordecai Ham, and we get Billy Graham because of 
Edward Kimball responding to the call. So I thought that was pretty cool. And that could be one of us. You never know. If you could be that, have the ear of Ananias and listen when the Lord speaks to you and says, Tom, and you say, yes, Lord, here I am. If you can have that type of ear and listen like Edward Kimball did, who knows what God may do through you. And we, you may be able to witness to somebody here in the hallways or at Chick-fil-A or at work, wherever it may be. And that young person, old person, they could, they could go on to save 100,000 people through whatever ministry they build up. You just never, never know. So with that, let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for tonight and for this time. And Lord, I, I just pray again that uh, I, the words that I shared were okay. But I just pray, Lord, that as I was talking, others heard your word, your voice. Being believers, Lord, we know that you can speak to them. So, Lord, I pray that you spoke to, to someone, at least one person here tonight, if not every one of us, and gave them maybe a calling and gave them a direction or gave them just a word to pursue and to follow up on. So, Lord, I just pray that you would continue to minister to each and every one of us. And, Lord, help us, Lord, to, to be in your word, to be reading it and studying it. And, Lord, um, just thank you again for this opportunity tonight to share your word. And, Lord, just bless our time together as we may linger and talk. And as we leave here and go our separate ways tonight, just bless our time and bring us back here safely once again, um, if not Thursday, then on Sunday. In uh, Jesus Christ's name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen.